Happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. risen Come on, he's risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Well, hey, I want to just draw your attention. By the way, my name's Gary, lead pastor here at Legacy. Thank you for, it's just great having you here with us today. Uh, There's a card that you should have probably sat on. I'm going to ask everybody, this is all play, all play, all skate in the same direction. If you could pull, if you... (laughs) A reference to roller rinks. Okay, uh, if you could pull that card out, can, can you just kind of wave it at me when you got it in your hand? Maybe we just add a little more house light, just a tad more house light, just for a moment. Grab a pen there. Uh, and what I'm gonna ask you to do is uh, just go ahead and, and you notice there's not a place for your name. So this is very safe, right? It's like, ah, what are they trying to get me? No, just it's very safe. Just demographic there put your check the box appropriate box your age demographic and then right underneath that there's a section that says I'd like to hear what the Bible says about this is our Easter survey and we're just really wanting to you know we we, we try to hear from the Holy Spirit for sure as far as what what we're teaching on but but also from just the community from people and what is it God laid on your heart what would you like to hear the Bible say about, and then we develop series, uh, teaching series, often around those things that you mentioned. Then there's a blank there for you as well. Uh, at the very bottom, where you when you walk with walk with God, and I'm going to ref- reference the card a little bit later, so don't let that get too far away from you. Uh, but just go ahead and fill that out, and just set it down to the side for just a moment. So. Everybody's working. You're working. It's Easter. And I don't know about you. How many of you had a, 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 how many of you had a great week? It was a good week. We have a good week. Anybody have a tough week? Just be, you know, like, man, it was a hard week. Where's my, where's my tough week? Where's my, like, this was a hard week. Uh, Let me just say this. The disciples this last week, like if we're going back to the first century, when this all took place, this was a week to be reckoned with. This was a tough one. And if you've ever had a, if you've ever had a tough week, uh, I, I think uh, like, like for, the, for the disciples, it would have been like, like the, the final week of a three-year training camp, like, like master class, boot camp, and warfare week, all like culminating this week. It was intense, right? So uh, at the end of a hard week, sometimes you look like this. Check it out. That ever happened? Like, man, what a, thank God it's. Or, or worse, yeah, you could it could end up like looking like this guy right here. Congratulations, we made it. this week is over. I sometimes like the, the, like the disciples may have felt like this, and I'm not a cat lover, but there you go. What started on a high note, let's just go there. Sunday, triumphal entry, like wow, it was, it was, an, amazing, it was an amazing start. Monday, so, so Sunday, triumphal entry, everybody's feeling good except the donkey, but we'll just leave that alone. Monday is clear the temple. Jesus goes back into Jerusalem and he clears the temple uh, and, he, and he uses references like my house, my house will be called a house of prayer. And then Tuesday, there's, uh, there's, there's some teaching that he does, and his authority is challenged and questions. And in fact, it's on Tuesday that Judas signs over the, like the, the, the act of betrayal is going to take place. Date and time, and I'll be there. And the money is exchanged. Wednesday, really not a lot is said about Wednesday. Wednesday looks like maybe Jesus just hung out in Bethany with Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus. Then you got Thursday. Thursday, things started to heat up just a little bit. The Last Supper in the upper room, that's where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. It's a teaching time. Then they move out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying in the droplets of blood. I mean, this is an intense moment for Jesus. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas, where Judas comes up and he kisses Jesus identifying that this is the one that you need to arrest. The soldiers, of course, are there, and chaos ensues, right? Like, like we got, they got all this, all this military that they show up with. In fact, Jesus, 
has a little bit of a hard time with. He says, man, I've been teaching in the open public. Like, I've been at the temple every day. Why, you, you, you know I'm, I'm not gonna resist. What do you, what's all this? But it, but it incites something in Peter. Come on, let's give it a shout out to Peter. Peter grabs one of those Roman guys' sword. He starts swinging, man, and taking ears off. It's in the Bible. It's there. Disciples are running everywhere, scattered. There's even a, there's even a streaking disciple. It's in there, in Mark. Like he was coming to warn them, and he was just had his, like a, like a blanket, right? And then, yeah. Disciples running, Peter's winging, and Jesus arrested. It's Friday. He goes to a, what would be a, that was Thursday. Then Friday is really the kicker. That Jesus is tried by Jewish and Roman authorities. It's a bogus trial, really. The jeering of the people, they choose Barabbas, the, the, the murderer, instead of Jesus. And if you notice throughout Friday, his, his closest allies and friends are nowhere to be seen. Peter's incognito. He's following at a distance. And this is the same, this is the same Peter who said, Lord, I'll never leave you. Even if all others abandon you, I won't. And he's following at a distance incognito. And he can't even stand up to a teenage girl who says, I, didn't I see you with them? And he absolutely denies Jesus thrice, three times. Jesus is led away to be whipped and then to the cross to be crucified. And this is where things get ugly. It gets brutal. It's where he dies the worst possible death on Friday, a criminal's death. And the disciples knew. They'd seen, they'd seen crucifixions before. This was not unheard of. And they knew that this would, not, this would not end well. And they watched from a distance as Jesus was crucified on Friday, the spitting, the mocking, the whipping, the crown of thorns, the spikes in his hands and feet, the spear after he was hoisted up, the spear that was plunged into his side, all the brutality, every hellish act of torture. With every hellish act of torture, their hopes were dashed. Their sense of promise destroyed. The beating that he took absolutely dispelled any footing of faith that they had in their leader. The fact that he just gave up, I'm sure that bothered Peter as he was thinking about the incidents in the garden, like, why did he just buckle? Why did he just give in? Why didn't he fight a little bit? How could things go terribly wrong in their future with Jesus seem to extinguish right before their eyes and they scatter and they're hiding literally in fear for their lives? Like, like if they took, like, like, Death by association, arrest by association. If they took Jesus out, then, then we're, we're on the hit list. They want us. Our, our faces are in every post office. I don't think they do that anymore. Anyways, and Jesus' body is taken down by Joseph of Arimathea. And he's placed in a borrowed tomb. And then Saturday comes. Saturday's crickets, really no activity, nothing going on. And I can, but I, I, we don't read of anything going on, but I can tell you what's not going on. What's not going on is the disciples are not sitting in a room singing resurrection songs. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Can't wait, I can't wait. It's going to be great. Not a one. Up from the gray hair of the mind. None. And we know this because at the resurrection of Jesus, none of his followers were there. And then Sunday rolls around today. And I want to read the account, probably the one that I enjoy the most. They're all great. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. This is the women. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened... 
uh, and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, here's a great line, why seek ye, why are you searching? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Come on, he is risen, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale. Again, just a very briefly as first century in the first century women held no status they're, what they were what they said they're, 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 you could not give a, a, a defense in court it just was not taken seriously and so the fact that that throughout the gospels that Jesus had women in place to deliver the word is pretty awesome but Peter rose and ran to the tomb Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This morning, I want to give just three observations, three observations regarding Resurrection Sunday that I, I want us to, to take a look at. I want us to find a handle. I, I, I want us to find a handle, something that, and take home something that maybe, maybe you've never thought of before, not because I was so clever to spin this narrative a different way, but but that the Holy Spirit would give you a handle, something to hang on to, something of the empty tomb by the power of the Holy Spirit. The first observation I'd like to talk about quickly is Resurrection Sunday, number one, requires belief, a belief in the miraculous. Resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous. That if indeed God entered space and time into his creation, and that since he entered the heavens and the earth, since he entered the heavens and the earth, guess what? He can do whatever he wants. Not excluding calling dead things back to life, dead people. But let me just make this important point. This this hit me later as I reread this point. Resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous. By saying Resurrection Sunday requires belief in the miraculous is not saying check your brain at the door. And all the intellect said, thank you. There's a God in heaven who created the intellect and the synapsis of the brain who knows what we're capable of intellectually speaking. It's just that his thinking goes so much further than our human capacity that we are left stupefied. In fact, his his word says, my thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts and my ways so much higher than your ways. As as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. So I'm not contending. I'm not contending for a mindless faith. By all means, keep thinking and processing and dissecting, but just be sure to leave room for the omnipotent creator of the heavens and earth to work the miraculous. Leave room. Think by all means and be the first to give him praise when he does something for which you cannot explain. So I, I'd like to personalize the point. Resurrection Sunday requires I believe in the miraculous. Let that settle in. Resurrections in the first century uh, People coming back from the dead were not common occurrences unless Jesus was involved. And there were a couple, Lazarus and then the boy in the funeral procession. But not enough to where the disciples had context of this, obviously. They weren't thinking at the crucifixion. They weren't thinking to themselves, well, at least he's going to rise again. 
right? Where they were like, oh, this is horrible, but at least he's gonna, at least, guys, don't look, but at least he's gonna rise again. The brutal beating that he took, coupled with the, what they knew of crucifixions, beat the stuffing out of their belief system. And life has a way of doing that, by the way. You might say, you might be here, you might say, you know, yeah, when I was a kid, I, when I was a kid, I followed Jesus, but life happened. Or yeah, I used to go to church, but then dad left us, or mom was never there, or my brother died, or the church hurt us. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the narrative, we, we say things like, I used to believe, but, and whatever the but was, beat the stuffing out of our belief. Disillusionment sets in. And if that's you this morning, I want you to take heart because you're in good company. <laughs> you're in good company. Over the centuries, various theories have emerged to somehow try to discredit the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And we're not gonna take a lot of time to go here other than just to mention a few of them. Theories that, that tried to discredit the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The first one I wanna mention is the swoon theory. Swoon, everybody say swoon. Yeah, yeah, swoon. The swoon theory, where Jesus was only unconscious I like to call this the Princess Bride theory. <laughs> he was mostly dead. <laughs> mostly dead. But the Romans were really good at making sure that when you were crucified, you died. You were dead. It was confirmed. There was the wrong tomb theory where the women, the wrong tomb theory where the women made a mistake and went to the wrong tomb. Is open, oh, is he, no, but Mary saw when they, where they laid Jesus. There was no question. Then there was the stolen body theories for the, like thieves stole the bodies, but they forgot that the Romans had that thing pretty well secured. The disciples stole the body, but, but you gotta think that the disciples were ready to die for their faith. Like stealing the body would have been admitting their faith was meaningless. It made no sense. Then there was the religious leaders stole the body to, to produce it later. But if this was the case, they would, have, they would have produced it later to stop the rumors and the, and the, about the resurrection. They never produced the body. I like how Paul summarizes the facts. He tells us what happened to the body. 1 Corinthians 15, three says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. I love that he says he appeared to James. Like James was his brother. I mean, you know, it would take a lot for you to believe that your brother was the, the son of God. Like I know my brother. <laughs> and he did not believe. He did not, he was not there until after the resurrection. Then he became one of the leaders. Here's the point. Resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous, in the God of miracles. Let me tell you why that's important. Please don't miss this. Paul says it this way in Romans 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, he confesses and is saved. Listen, Resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous. Lord, I believe you died and you rose again for me, for me, for me. I pray today, listen, amen, yeah. I pray today, there's some of you here today that, that, that need to cross that line, to, to make that declaration, Lord, today 
I declare on this Easter Sunday, 2024, that you are my Lord and that you are my Savior. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. Let me give you the second observation moving along. Second observation on this, that Resurrection Sunday not only requires a belief in the miraculous, but it's all about hope. Resurrection Sunday is all about hope. Hope, it's what made the difference then, and it's what still makes the difference today. As I put on my athleisure wear this morning, getting ready for church, I thought, my, we've come a long way in the last 25 years. I might have had a tie on. <laughs> that was funnier in my head than when it just came out. <laughs> The resurrection of Jesus, listen, it's instilled a hope where once everything seemed lost and futile. What happened? Think about it. Now think about it. Fearful followers who weren't even looking for a resurrection, they were hiding out. They weren't trying to concoct a resurrection. Nobody was stealing dead bodies. They were hiding out for fear for their life, that they were going to be put to death. Again, fear by association. Something happened to these guys as a result of that first Easter morning. Suddenly, these disciples are infused with courage. They're emboldened. They are willing to die for the cause of Christ. That first Easter morning began a firestorm. Word began to leak. A report here, a validation there, a sighting. The women brought back a sighting. We saw him, we were with him. And hope begins to swell. And it's almost comical that hope does strange things to you when it hits. Like in the New Testament, everyone just starts running. Running. It's like when a pregnant woman says, I think it's time. Everybody just starts running, right? Hope does that. Mary and the other ladies run to, the, to tell the disciples. Peter and John run to the, they run to the tomb. They race there. It's just what a little bit of hope does. How about the two guys that were heading back towards Emmaus? They were dejected. They were downcast. They were followers of Jesus, and they were just, just down, like just going back to same old, same old, and Jesus joins them on the, on the journey, on the road to Emmaus. But they're kept from recognizing that it's Jesus. Something about his resurrected body did not allow them to, their eyes weren't open, they couldn't tell. He walks with them, and they invite him into their home. He acted as if he was going to go a little further. And they said, no, why don't you come? It's late. Have, have some dinner with us. So he goes in and he joins the men. And the Bible says this. And here's what happened. Luke chapter 24. He sat down at the table with them. Taking the bread, he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them. I wonder if it was something in the way he broke the bread. And in the way he blessed it. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him, and then he disappeared. Back and forth, they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us, and they didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. That's what hope does. It gets you out of a place of of. Uh, uh, downcast and, and depression and can move you back into a place of hope. It's kind of that hurried run walk that you do at the airport to try to look like you're in control of things still, but you run walking and then you run. And... <laughs> because of hope, hope does that. Resurrection Sunday is all about Renewed hope. It gives you hope for situations you deemed beyond hope. It, it sends you back to a dream that you once walked away from, a prayer that you stopped praying, an activity that you ceased to engage in, a cancer diagnosis that you thought spelled the end. My friend Pam attends legacy here. She's an artisan. 
an artist to the core. She might say a carny. That's just another word for artist. She lives in North Idaho and was preparing for a craft show in Seattle, a craft show. And when she was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor, she was preparing for the craft show in Seattle when she was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor in her stomach. And almost immediately, almost immediately she let go of the art show that she was working so diligently on. And, and there was another art show that she was doing here with the Legacy Ladies. The diagnosis literally sucked the air out of her life and her home. And what I didn't tell you is 10 years ago, I think it was around 10 years ago, Pam had battled breast cancer and, and by the grace of God beat it. And then this, 10 years later in her stomach, not too long after that original diagnosis here, she had a follow-up appointment with her doctor who said, Pam, the cancer in your stomach is of the same variety as the breast cancer, and it's very treatable. Hope. When he said, it's very treatable. Hope. Those two words sent Pam running. She signed back up for the Seattle Art Show. She got back involved, called Patty, said, I'm gonna do the lady, Legacy Ladies Art Show. Hope emerged, an extension of life, renewed purpose. I'm still, I mean, listen, she's still in the battle. She's still fighting. But lest we forget, Pam also lives by an additional narrative that all those who are in Christ live under. And it's three words, he is risen. He is risen. We might not all hear very treatable, but let me tell you, we, we all get to hear, he is risen. He is risen. Three words that spark hope. Three words that send disciples running, sent the followers of Jesus into a frenzy of joyous activity. He's risen and the church was born. He's risen and death is conquered. A new courage and authority emerged in the heart of those first century believers and to us. It's why we celebrate. It's why we smile today. It's why the swell truck's out in the parking lot and we have Krispy Kreme. Do we have Krispy Kreme donuts out there? It's why we have Krispy Kreme donuts out there. It's why we set up more chairs. It's why we had add a third service. Why? Because he's risen. We want to celebrate. We want the world to know. We want the world to know. Resurrection Sunday is all about hope, even in the face of the grimmest of circumstances, even when staring death in the face, which last I checked is still batting a thousand. He is risen. He is risen. One day, well, one day we'll all have to face that. But I love the hope of Romans 8 11 that says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Come on, that's hope. Jesus said, John eleven twenty five, 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Yet shall he live. That's a hope. We have a daughter, our youngest daughter, she, she's with Jesus in heaven. We lost 20, 30, over 35 years ago. And the older we get, you know what? Heaven's getting really sweet. I mean, I'm not in any, any hurry to go, but, <laughs> but there's an investment there. There's hope. He is risen is synonymous with hope. So Resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous. Resurrection Sunday invites hope. Here's the last observation. Resurrection Sunday reminds us of a God with scars. In fact, if you're taking notes, the, top, the message is entitled God with Scars. We meet a guy in scripture by the name of Thomas, better known as Doubting Thomas. And I like him because he's an honest representation of all of us. 
Thomas is all of us at some point in our lives. Cynics, skeptics, and the intellects, raised in the church, new to the church, hate the church. We all have expressed doubt in one form or another. It just so happens the Thomas moment got recorded in the Bible. <laughs> Unfortunate. The story is the disciples were telling Thomas about the resurrected Jesus, right? He hadn't seen Jesus yet, so they were just telling, they were spreading the word. We saw Jesus, look at it. Now Thomas, John 20, 24, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side. Come on, read it out loud with me. I will never believe. Brah. Thomas, wow. Wow. I won't believe unless I place my hands in his side, unless I see him for myself. Seeing is believing. Like if this were a social media post, like that moment, never. And the disciples. <laughs> the comment section would be really, it would sound something like this. People don't just come back from the dead. Thomas was right to question the disciples like this. Seeing is believing, I always say. I'm sick and tired of these resurrectionists imposing their fabricated stories on everybody. I think we're entitled to believe what we want and we don't need this resurrection stuff shoved down our blah, 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 blah. God, why do you go there and live in that world? I don't know. Same vitriol, same venomous spewing, same mindlessness. And they often fail to read the rest of the story. Eight days later, Jesus meets Thomas and some of the others behind locked doors. Which, by the way, his resurrected body can now just pass through. Oh, to be a fly on the wall at this moment. Jesus and Thomas. I would, when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, Lord, could you play that one back for me? I'd love to just <laughs> see that. Eight days later, John 20, 26, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, <laughs> put your finger here. See my hands. And put your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. That word believe, that this Greek word pastuo, which is believe with a trust. Trust in me, Thomas. And Thomas answered and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus said, place your hands here and here. Look at my feet. And Thomas' immediate response was worship, my Lord and my God. You are who you say you are. And while all that is amazing, the fact that his body, the resurrected body, was not a phantom or a ghost, he actually ate food. One translation, one narrative, one of the gospel writers said, it's the skin and bone, it's here. But my favorite part is Jesus still had scars. His glorified body still had scars. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, God with scars. Why is that important to me? It's, it, the more I just read it and sat on this passage, there's a couple reasons, because our scars tell stories. We like, I don't know if it's just a man thing. I don't think it is. I think all of us like to tell, we have a scar. I'm talking about an external scar. I, I like to tell the accompanying story. Anybody with me? Like if you hang around at Legacy for very long, you're gonna hear my Achilles heels story. Like somebody passed me the balls at the top of the key. 
got the basketball. It's a basketball. Top of the key. And here's what I did. I had the ball, top of the key. Defender was coming up on me. And, and, and I, this is what I did. And when I did that, pop. That's all I did. I wasn't slam dunking. I wasn't doing anything impressive. I went like this. And I went down like a wounded duck. And I hit the ground and I said, who threw that? I don't know why I said it, but those were the first words that came out of my mouth. It felt like somebody took the side of a tennis racket on the back of my Achilles and hit it as hard as they could. And I went down. And I groped around on the ground for a while and somebody assessed and diagnosed, you, 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 you tore your Achilles tendon. My brother took me to the hospital and a year later, a year of wearing a cast in those days, 30 years ago, it took a year of recovery for that thing. And the story just goes on ad nauseum, right? And I will be showing my Achilles <laughs> at, the, at the swell truck afterwards. I'll be... <laughs> it's 30 years old, this scar. Why do I bring it up? When I see it, it reminds me of what happened. It reminds me of the pain of that moment. But it doesn't define me. Amen. That would be crazy. That would be like, oh, there's the guy with the Achilles tendon tear 30 years ago. <laughs> it's just, it, it's a visible reminder now of something that was painful. What's the point? Imagine when Jesus got the word that Thomas is having belief issues. Eight days later, what does Jesus do to convince Thomas? I mean, he could have done a miracle. He could have said, right? He could have called down fire. He could have done, he had his, he had the, right, at his disposal. What does he do? He says, look at my scars. Of all the things he could have done to prove that he was the Messiah. He shows him his scars. Jesus said, put your hands here and here and put your hand, put it on my side. What was Jesus saying? He said, it's me, Thomas, it's me. It's me. Your risen Savior, God incarnate. God made flesh. I, I'm a God with scars. I'm a God with scars. Get this. So you always know that I understand yours. These scars, Thomas, represent a lot of pain, but you're worth it. Every spike, every sword, every bit of the beating that I took said, I love you. Look at my hands. Look at my side. Look at my feet. These scars on my resurrected body say, I love you. And listen, this applies to many of us in this room today. Some of us carry emotional scars, internal wounds, father wounds, mom wounds, tragedies that you've walked through or others who you loved, that you love have walked through and you saw them walk through it and somehow it just angered you and you, and you, you became like Thomas and you turned away. I'll never believe. Injustices that, you, that have jaded you and for some, listen, for some, the wound has festered and it's embittered your life and it's slowed you down and it's made you more and more angry and there's more and more loss and it's distanced you from God. Here's what you can know about your scars because of the resurrection and I'm gonna close with this, that Jesus understands them. He understands pain and abuse and being hated. Think about it. He wants you to see his scars and he wants you to know because he overcame, so can you. So can you. He's a God with scars. You'll always know. You'll always know. We'll always know. He'll, he understands yours. That was written. That was put in there for us to remember that, know that. He's saying, place your hands here. Put your, here, right here. Look at my feet. These scars are for you. Place your points of hurt, your doubt, your anger, your resistance, and simply, and just simply today, just in faith, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. He understands them. Secondly, they don't have to define you. 
Because he is risen, they don't have to define you. These scars, Jesus' scars were inflicted by Roman soldiers, but never once, and this is so important, did he reduce his scars to that level. Never once did Jesus say, well, look at the, look what the Romans did. Look at it. Look what the Romans did, and they're terrible. He didn't waste his breath blaming the source. Jesus repurposed his scars to tell a greater story than Roman bullies. What's the point? Stop living under the power of the scars and the narrative, the hurt and the wound. Stop pointing at the past, at the source. Stop breathing about the past and giving life to that. Do what Thomas did, worship him, worship him. Lastly, because he's risen, and all these are because he's risen, he wants to repurpose your scars. There's a good chance you're gonna run into someone gashed and bludgeoned emotionally by life, and it's, it gives opportunity to share your story. to say to somebody else, put your hand here. I may not exactly identify with everything you're going through, but I understand scars, I understand wounds. But because he is risen, I don't have to carry this anymore. I don't carry this anymore. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? Legacy, we're gonna close out our time here He is risen. I wonder if on this resurrection Sunday, thinking of those last, those statements, the resurrection Sunday requires a belief in the miraculous. Resurrection Sunday is all about hope. Resurrection Sunday reveals that we have a God with scars. He's a He's acquainted with our suffering. He's acquainted. And today, I wonder if there's one or two in this house at the 8.30 gathering on Easter Sunday that would say, Gary, I want that God to be a part of my life. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior and King of my life. And today, I'd like to dedicate my life to him. Here's, here's Here's what I'd like to do. I'm just gonna ask you in, in just a few seconds here, if that's you and you'd like to, me to include you in our closing prayer today, to just lift your hand up in a moment and put it right back down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna count to three. And in fact, I, I don't want, we don't wanna miss you, so I've got some of our prayer team helping me just make sure that we see the hands that go up today. It's just so important. But you would say, would you include me in your closing prayer today? Gary, I I want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and King. I I want to confess him as Lord today and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. That's you. I'm going to count just down from three. Three, two, one. Just lift it up all over this place. Thank you. Thank you. Just lift it up. Make sure I can see it. Just put it up boldly. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't want to miss you. Thank you, sir. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you just pray this prayer with me in your heart? Lord Jesus, I receive you as Lord and King today. I confess I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Thank you that you gave your life for me and that you rose again on the third day for me. I worship you today. I thank you. I, like Thomas, say, my Lord and my God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Let's worship with the band, and I'm gonna come back and close us in just a minute.